You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm very pleased to have back as a special guest again, Mark de Messel from Belgium. Hi, Mark. Hi, Jake. How's it going? Very well. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you for coming on again, because um, we were just chatting about how it would be interesting to do another um, podcast on investment. And in particular, one of the things that we were talking about that I think could be useful for people to uh, to hear about is, is um, investing and inflation and dealing with inflation. Um, because I know that's something that you've spent a lot of time thinking about with regard to your own investment and what you need to do to ensure that um, the inflation doesn't kind of uh, cause you unforeseen problems. Yes, uh, indeed. Um, yeah, I think inflation, um, as uh, we talked about in the last podcasts about investing in Europe, uh, but um, yeah, I think that inflation is crucial uh, in estimating it right um, when you are investing mm. and and it is very, very difficult to do so because, um, well, all uh, the official inflation, of course, isn't uh, correct. Eh? Today, that would be around 1%, 2%. Everybody knows that's not true. Mm. Um, but then where, how do you have to estimate inflation? Um, because well, if me, you... Let yeah, me go ahead. ask you, like, cause I definitely want to get into that. But let's just, for, for people who are thinking about this, who are saving and investing and planning for their future and they want as much financial freedom as possible, let's just go right back to, um, to basics. So, you know, what, what is inflation and how should it be understood for someone who's, uh, who's an individual saver and investor? Yeah, inflation is just the amount of um, uh, purchasing power you're your money loses every year huh? and um, and we all know it's there but we're kind of fooling ourselves easily as investors um, f- for example if you get the same amount of dollars today or uh, pounds today or euros today for let's say your real estate or some kind of uh, crappy investment as you had put into it uh, uh, let's say five or ten years ago Huh? Mm-hmm. Then, then investors um, um, easily say to themselves, well, at least I got my money back out of it. Huh? Mm-hmm. But of course, that's not true. If you have the same amount of dollars today as five years ago uh, or, or 10 years ago, it's a lot less that you get back. Huh? Yeah, indeed. And of course, the same is true of uh, wages. If you're simply earning a wage, you know, if you're making the same, uh, each year, and you know, a lot of people have had no pay rise for um, you know since the the sort of Great Recession started. Um, then actually, your your wages is, uh, are not staying the same; they're falling in real terms because the purchasing power of what you can buy with those wages um, is dropping each year. Yes, uh, that's, that's correct. Uh, yeah, and so the question is like, okay, how high is this um, uh, inflation? Mm. Huh? Um, and uh, like in wages, for example, well, people get a rise of, let's say, 2% a year on average. Yeah. Um, and th- that's what's being uh, d- negotiated uh, mostly. But 2% is not good enough. Indeed, uh, I'm estimating inflation uh, in, US, in the US as well as the UK, as in the Eurozone, to be around 4 to 5%. Right, right. Now, this is because the official inflation figures um, produced by the UK government or the US government or governments within the Eurozone, those don't reflect what we might call true inflation. And so can you explain what, you know, what is the difference and why, why is it that you can't really trust um, an inflation figure that you hear on the news to, to, to reflect what you will experience when you go to the shops and try and buy, you know, your your um, groceries for the for the week. 
Yeah, of, well, the difference is the, 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 the official inflation, they put some products in, others not, and they have a lot of techniques to um, actually um, to manipulate that. Eh? Mm. Um, so, for example, um, they will have uh, meat in it, uh, a steak, for example, uh, and then um, you have some kind of... Uh, uh, so, let's say that the steak is going up every year by let's say 7% the last 10 years in mm. price. Mm. Uh, but what they do then is they say, well, but now we have innovation. We have now a new kind of steaks that is um, actually, um, uh, it's not the same steak, uh, but it's uh, a little less quality, but it's also uh, good. Uh, and let's, let's replace the steak we have in here with this lower quality steak. Right, yeah? right, right. And, and of course, this lower quality steak is, let's say, 20% cheaper. And up, the inflation of steaks drops from 7% to 2% or 3%. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And they, the, the, it's called um, hedonic modeling, some of the, the work that they do, where the idea is that, um, well, products are changing and people are getting, you know, new, better products. So therefore, there is a price increase associated with the increase in the quality of the product. Um, so you can't really compare prices, say, five years ago um, for phones and for um, computers and various things. So we have to we have to factor in these various things. And in, in short, what they do is they make up a bunch of numbers to try and make things comparable. And I mean, it is a real difficulty comparing the past to the present. But what seems to happen is that the way that this hedonic modeling is done ends up um, really underestimating the amount of, of, uh, of cash that you have to pay uh, for things in your everyday life. You know, in short, you, what you hear in the, in the newspapers and on, on the news about how high inflation is doesn't really reflect what you're going to experience when you need to go out there and buy stuff. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, you, 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 you said it uh, very well, uh, Jake, like that's indeed, uh, I, I didn't have that name, the hedonic modeling. Mm. And uh, indeed, it explains it very well what you're saying. Mm. Um, uh, so yeah, indeed. And uh, so I guess the question I was going to ask you is, all right, mm -hmm. so we think there's a difference between what official inflation is and what real inflation is. So how is um, an ordinary person supposed to know what a better estimate of real inflation is? Yeah, of course. Well, use your common, common mind, common sense always. Eh? And so if you go to the shop eh? and um, what's your estimation of how much prices are going up every, every year? Mm. Mm. You know, is it 2%? like the government says, or is it more? Mm. And that's the, that's the most important question. Eh? And here, where, where I shop, it's at least 5%, and some, some things really go up by 7% mm. a year. Mm. Now, there are some people who are... Um, I haven't looked into this very deeply, but I know there are some websites that try to create alternative... Uh, calculations of inflation. I think one of them is shadow stats yes. and various other ones. And so uh, like, I totally agree with you that you, know, you can use your common sense and you can, you can make an estimate based on your own experience of how much you think your cost of living is changing. Um, but you can also look at some other people who, alternative people who are coming up with their own calculations and there are some out there. And and, you know, it, have you looked into that? What's your experience of, of those kinds of uh, websites? Yeah, actually, Shadow Stats is the only one I know. Mm. Um, and I have uh, studied him, though I have never subscribed. Uh, and I am quite curious to have more details. But if I remember correctly, his, his uh, calculation of inflation is around, it's somewhere between 5 and 7%. Right. Uh, what's, according to him, uh, real inflation. Um, and he uses the, the, the calculation uh, techniques as they were used also by the government uh, still in the uh, 70s. Yeah, um, before they started massaging the figures more, so to speak. Indeed. And in the 70s, official inflation was also around 7%. Mm. Uh, so he uses the same calculations and he also has it around 5, 6, 7% today in the U.S., 
Um, so, and I think I haven't studied uh, it in detail, but I do believe him uh, when he says that. Mm. Mm. So I think that's one, uh, one source um, that is interesting yeah. uh, and good. But I, I think that I don't know any, anyone else who calculates inflation. Um, but I do think there are different ways to uh, calculate inflation if you want to do it yourself. Mm. And, and that is like, okay, you can go to the shops, but of course that's quite vague and you don't have only have prices in shops. You have also the prices for the bills you get at home for utilities. You have the prices for cars. You have the prices for real estate, for stocks, for bonds, for gold. Actually, if you want to calculate true inflation, you have to include all assets, products, as well as services, you know, yeah. and that's impossible, you right. know, right. so you, but you can guess it, but you can never calculate it. Huh? So your, your approach is to say, look, we know that inflation is higher than the official estimate. I'm going to make it just a, 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 a guess based partly on my personal experience, partly on intuition, but I realize it's not going to be an accurate calculation, but I'm just going to guess it to be at, at uh, this much higher than the official rate. Is that right? Well, I did, I did try to guess it as right as possible. And so uh, like it, is, it remains a guess, huh? mm. but I think it is because... And so what other uh, indicators am I using to come at this 5%? Huh? Um, for 5% me, the, is your estimate, right? That's my estimate, yeah. 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 And um, uh, why, wh what other indicators do I use? Well, actually, the other important indicator I'm using is um, how much money is the government printing right. per year? Huh? Because actually, actually, that's the best indicator, I think. Huh? Because um, let's say the, the, money print, uh, the government prints 10% uh, of uh, money every year. Uh, and, and brings it into the economy, um, well, then, then the prices will go up eh, by an average of uh, not 10%, but a little less, but we can talk about that later. But normally it's minus 2%, so it, the prices will go up if, on average by 8%. But of course, if you would try to calculate in the economy how much is every product and service going up in price. That's impossible. You have too many. Uh, uh, also, you have to include all assets. Um, and indeed, in the economy, products are changing, services are changing. So it's just an impossible task. And it actually, it's, it's, you don't even have to do it because it is of no importance. The prices will go up always equal to the amount of extra money that is being printed. Right, you know? right. And this is because the root of inflation is the amount of money in circulation. Obviously, the more money there is circulating around for the same amount of goods and services, then the more inflation that there's going to be, um, prices will go up because each good and pro or service will, will need to take a larger chunk of that overall, a, a larger part because the overall pile of money is bigger, so to speak. And if, if the quantity of money reduces, then that would be deflation. So what you're saying is that um, ultimately it's going to be really, really hard to tell on an individual product basis what inflation is. But if you look at how much money is being printed, that should give you a good proxy or a good indicator of what inflation is going to end up being, because ultimately that's sort of the root cause of inflation. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Huh? Um, and so... And I'm always thinking a lot to understand this all uh, back at the golden, uh, uh, when we still had the gold as money, mm. um, because that really helps. The world was much more simple then, and it helps me to understand it uh, today. And so uh, at the time when gold was money and silver, um, uh, the amount of gold every year um, went up with 2%. Huh? Right. Uh, so uh, people dig for gold and uh, the amount of gold they found every year was around 2%. Yeah. Uh, and so extra huh? uh, every year. But of course, the amount of um, goods, services, uh, real estate, stocks um, also went up with on average 2% per year. Right. Um, and why, why does, is this the same? Because, well, it's the, 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 the uh, how much pe uh, gold people can find 
is very connected to the tools they have right. how how far a, a society is advanced and how many yeah and so and so but the same is true for the amount of real estate that is being produced every year or products or services so it's the same so it goes up in the same rate and so gold was excellent money because um okay you had two percent more gold every year but you also had two percent more houses every year so basically the price of a house in gold remained the same right right um and so so that's how it used to be of course you also had um economic uh, climates at the time also and so you had periods of prosperity like the golden uh, age in the netherlands in 1600 uh, when a trade took up uh, and so what happened then in the Netherlands, for example, was that prices for real estate in gold doubled. Huh? Mm -hmm. So during times of prosperity, real estate became more expensive um, uh, because it was bid up. Huh? Yeah. Um, uh, but then uh, uh, 10 or 20 years after that, you had a, a collapse and then uh, the house prices fell. Uh, in gold terms and um, actually what you see is that it came lower to the average but you had an average uh, of uh, that was very stable like from 1620 till 1950 the average price of a house in Amsterdam in the Herengracht those are luxurious houses mm. uh, um, it was around uh, four kilograms of gold. And it huh? just remained pretty stable. Yeah, which is about 120 ounce, ounces. So that was like for 400 years, the price. Sometimes it was eight kilograms and sometimes it was only two kilograms. Huh? Mm. But the average price was four kilograms. And so that was how what, uh, money worked. Huh? And mm. so uh, the, the money, the gold uh, that you had, it, 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 it remained its purchasing power. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, and so... But now we live in an age, but now we live in an age where it's paper currency. Yeah. Um, which means that it, the amount of currency that we have is purely dependent on how much the central banking system uh, is is generating through government edict essentially right yeah indeed so um uh, but uh, I, I just want to add that also it happened in uh, when gold was money that you had serious inflation um and that was the period where the spaniards um this um, actually robbed empty uh, uh latin america right. um, uh, uh, from all the gold that was resourced there by the tribal communities uh, and um, suddenly like it they discovered basically a big pile of gold which they um, um imported into europe and uh, suddenly it wasn't two percent per year more gold but suddenly a few years a lot more gold yeah and that makes sense because that's effectively the same as if, as just printing a whole load of money they just discovered a whole load of extra gold so that lead, led to inflation in the same way that if you suddenly print a whole lot of money you'll get inflation right indeed so so that means that uh, uh, like the prices for real estate and uh, products like went up suddenly in gold terms mm. you know and so you if you owned like gold like most people like suddenly you could buy considerably less with it due right. to due to inflation you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so so it can happen in a gold era too um so but indeed today so we don't have gold as money but paper currencies and so um what, what for example here the ecb in europe uh, how much euros are they printing a year on average it's um it was uh, seven percent until 2008 the crisis and since then it has been up to around 13 percent the last time i calculated per year huh? wow well that's significantly yeah. more than five percent absolutely so it has been seven percent till, till 2008 mm. and so um and of course that's what they say you never 100 percent sure if that's true they could right. as well print a lot more and they don't say it but let, let's say that it's true their numbers huh? mm. uh, and so that's what they have printed well that kind of makes sense to me because indeed like if you print 
7% more euros. Huh? Actually, they can print 2% more euros every year or dollars or, you, or pounds. They can do that without prices going up because every year you have 2% more uh, goods and services. Huh? So they can print 2% per year without prices going up. But like here in Europe, they printed 7%. Now, just to say, yeah? just so that people um, kind of understand that. So in other words, if we had a gold standard now, and we were, um, let's say that they, there was no gold discovered for a couple of years, we would actually experience everything getting cheaper in the way that, um, you know, you experience computing stuff gets cheaper and everything because society produces more goods, more services, we have more prosperity just through economic development. Um, and we would just, we would, if the money supply was completely stable, we would, we would be able to buy 2% more with the same amount of money. But if we have inflation, where the money supply is growing with the economy at exactly the same pace, 2%, then we will experience just that our money buys the same amount. But what that means is that as a government, you can actually print at least 2% without anyone noticing anything, because what you've done is just essentially removed the uh, sort of benefit of economic growth uh, that people would feel in cheap prices. Indeed, indeed. Uh, aye, that's very well said. So yeah, they could like basically steal 2% per year and uh, people wouldn't experience prices going up, but actually they would lose the benefit of, uh, of actually being able to buy 2% per year more with right. uh, goods and services with their money. Yeah, that's very yeah. correct. Yeah. This is why inflation is known as a hidden tax because it is taking away money from you without you actually seeing that the money is being taken away. When you get taxes off in, the, in your wages or you have to pay um, taxes, you can see, oh, I earned this and now I have to give this amount to the government. But actually what's happening is that that's, or you've already been taxed without knowing it because the government is able to get basically free money, which has an impact on what your money will eventually buy. Yeah, absolutely. Like it, it is... Uh a huge tax um it is uh just right because i, I was actually sorry i was actually mm -hmm. you were in the process of explaining that it's not even two percent they've already stolen like effectively two percent but it actually goes much further than that because they're currently printing uh ten percent more per year right indeed or even, or even more mm -hmm. so that means that you're getting a hidden tax of maybe ten percent plus on your uh on your income yeah uh, uh absolutely it's like uh, let's say at the time uh, when we had a gold standard that um so uh, someone invented a gold producing machine huh? mm. and uh, and 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 like produced 10 percent more gold per year and uh, went into the economy and buy a whole lot of stuff with it yeah huh? they would basically get free stuff <laughs> yeah so so he 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 prints gold out of uh, thin air uh, and then goes buy all the stuff in the economy and, and spend it on, on all kind of nice stuff. And uh, what, what would people experience? People would see that, oh my God, there's really a lot of uh, buying going on here. A lot of uh, uh, like a lot of uh, gold flowing in and actually like prices are going up mm. by 10% because um, and actually the gold I'm having, I can buy 10% less uh, every year. Uh, what's happening? You know? Yeah. Now, I don't understand though, if you're, if you're thinking, okay, the amount of money that the ECB is printing is a good guide to inflation. You said how much you said they're printing like 13% year at the moment. Is that right? Yes. So why don't you why don't you assume 13% as inflation then? Um, well, I, I would have to deduct two percent eh, for for um, because eh, um, oh yeah they for can, growth yeah. right so so we then uh, would be at eleven percent yeah uh, ten eleven percent I have considered to uh, raise my estimate to that amount but I'm not doing it because um, there is another force going on in the economy and uh, I think that's also important to calculate so. What happens during deflation? Mm. And I think that's what's happening now. We are in deflation. Well, during times of deflation, the, the, the purchasing power of money goes up. Mm. Huh? And uh, w w what does that mean? So it's just during times of prosperity, people actually the economy is going well and people are very positive 
uh, uh, about their prospects and they are bidding up prices from uh, real estate, from stocks. Eh? And, and so you can see that the price level is going up, not only due to money printing, but also due because they value things higher, mm. you know? And, um, this, and what happens during deflation is that they do the inverse and they, they have less good, they are less positive, they are pessimistic and they have less good prospects and they start to value things lower. Huh? Yeah. Uh, and so what happens then is that the value of money goes up. Huh? Right. And, and so at the time when gold was money, it means that go the value of gold went up. But today, uh, gold is not money. Euros, uh, pounds and, and, and dollars is money. So what happens is that, well, prices of real estate stocks, they go down. And where is it going to? Well, it goes to money just the value of money yeah, like yeah. what what do they buy as a replacement well money yeah. they don't buy anything they just want to have more money you know right. and, uh, and so people are starting to compete to have money not to have real estate yeah you know? you're saying basically that the it's something like the propensity to hold money increases uh, yeah. relative to other things and that has a different that has a dampening effect on inflation Indeed. So, so uh, the inflation that was created pre-2005 in real estate for uh, 25 years in a row, people were bidding up the prices of real estate everywhere. Huh? Mm. Um, and uh, that was an inflationary force, you can say. Uh, and the cause was not money printing. It was just uh, people bidding up the price of real estate. Um, and so euros and pounds and dollars lost value due to that. And the inverse is happening since 2005. Um, uh, and so the purchasing power uh, of euros, dollars and pounds is going up versus, for example, real estate, simply because people are bidding down the price of real estate. Huh? Yeah. So, so that's how you come to your estimate of around yeah. 5%, let's say, which is still significantly higher than the official rate. Yeah, so, so uh, I would say that this contrary deflationary force, I would estimate this today, like it used to be plus 4%. Eh? I would say, I think it's today minus 4%. Eh? Mm. So, so I, I'm thinking today, okay, they print 13% more euros, you can deduct 2%, so that should, prices go, should go up at 11%, but then you have this deflationary force and euros go up in purchasing power because people bid down prices, so I can deduct another 4%. So yeah, we're around 6%, um, and yeah, that makes sense to me, you know? Mm. Uh, that explains it, because I can't really, it's not true that prices are going up at 10% Yeah, you of don't, you're not, it doesn't fit your experience. That no, special, no, it's it? only in shops, certain products, but, and gold, but all the rest is below, you know? Mm. So, but if I say 5, 6%, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that looks true where I live. Mm. Um, and so, and indeed, it makes sense with this theory behind it. Hmm? Yeah. That even though they are indeed printing 13% a year, it's, it's not, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not that much. Huh? Yeah. So let's say that you get to uh, an estimate that you've come to through, you know, your own calculations and, and thoughts about what's, what's happening, that you say it's 5 or 6% inflation. What does that, you know, what do you do with that information if you are um, thinking about how much you need to earn or save or get from your investments in order to uh, to live yeah so that's then it becomes very simple uh if you have five percent a year well you're just keeping up you just you just have the same as the year before you know you may have five percent more in euros uh or dollars or pounds but it's still the same basically you cannot buy more with it mm. Um, so you need to, ha and if you have less, you have a problem. You just lost. If you have only three percent, you just lost two percent purchasing yeah. power. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and, and of course, if you have more, that's what you really gained. Huh? Uh, if you let, let's say you succeed in having the seven percent, then you have two percent more than five percent, and that's like that you can really spend without losing purchasing power. Huh? Right. Right. So in other words. What you're doing is you're calculating from your investment what your real return is, your after inflation return. 
And in order to do that, you're deducting that five or six percent or whatever it is that you think is the estimate. Mm -hmm. And you're saying like, I have to make that just to stand still. And then once I've done that, anything I get beyond that, that is real return that isn't being eaten away by inflation. Yes, uh, indeed. Right. And uh, I want to add that uh, for me, since 2006, I had an average of six and a half percent return, mm. and that's included everything. Uh, so as also real estate uh, was in is included in that. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so six percent. So that means for me that yeah, I made one percent a year, huh? mm. um, and that has not been enough at all to cover my living expenses because I live from that. I I don't. Uh, do a day job or run a company. So yeah, you live from your investments. Yeah, I live from my investment. So and one percent was really not enough. Huh? Which so means that which means that you are effectively eating into your capital, even though from the from the um, from the sort of uh, gross numbers you wouldn't necessarily think you were because the inflation is hiding that right. Indeed, so I am losing purchasing power every year huh? because mm. I estimate my living expenses to be around three three percent, uh, maybe four, and so so I only make one percent, so I lose every year around three percent of my capital. Mm. Um, so I'm not making enough money to continue this. You know, I'm yeah. running out. <laughs> yeah. If if I keep it at this level, uh, I will be. I have I have a lot less capital and purchasing power in 10 20 years Which so is really need, this is this is really you know you seeing the hidden tax that's actually going on through inflation right uh y y yes uh, that's that's yeah yeah in that's, other words, that's what it means is that if you carried on like this for 20 years um then uh, you would see a, a hidden tax kind of eat away at uh, at your savings yeah indeed and uh, uh, I just got a new idea that I wasn't aware of before, but I, I never understood like how do people do this? Like, how is it possible? I'm making only six percent, and I'm I'm a good investor, you know. Mm. I, I've been very successful compared to most, mm. and I'm only making six percent, and real inflation is five percent, so I don't really make money. So, but but I know that other people don't neither, you know. So it's maybe one in a hundred that's making more than six percent a year, you know. So, so who, how is that possible? And now I suddenly realize it. Well, it's because you have a big thief, you know, thieving from everybody yes. every year five percent. You know, it's all. It's very hard to make money if if you, if 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 you lose five percent a year to a thief, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's true for everybody, you know. Yeah, that has money. That's true for everybody, even uh, even if they're not living off investments, they're just living off their wages as well. That's why that's why it's it's really hard to build up savings uh, because you are effectively losing money without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's another reason why it is quite hard to, uh, in my opinion, I think it's another reason why it is quite hard to actually really make your fortune through investing. I mean, you really, you know, if you're in an industry as an entrepreneur, then you can have the benefits of having some specialist inside knowledge of how to create some value where you can generate significantly more than that five or six percent uh, per year um, through your entrepreneurial ventures. At least, you know, the reason I say this is because that's how I did it. But I think if you only do it through investing and you try to really create a fortune through investing, uh, that's very difficult. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree with that, uh, Jake. That's that, that's certainly true. Like, um, it is um, it, no, it's not possible uh, through passive investing to make a fortune. Mm. Um, only the best are able to make. Like, I only know one one person that made twenty percent a year the last ten years, and um, after him, the next one makes only thirteen percent a year. And like it's a few in only a few in the world that, that succeed in that, and all the rest makes um, barely uh, through inflation. Yeah, and so, when it's one or two, you really have to think, you know, okay, look, statistically, there's going to be one or two people who just have blind luck after that amount of time anyway. 
-hmm. So, you know, it's not, it's not a reproducible thing that you can necessarily depend on or that you can at all depend on. So, yeah. So I think this is something that Harry Brown talks about in his book that you should really consider your your career as the way of making your fortune and investing as the way of, of basically preserving it and, and hopefully being able to live from it. But actually to create it that way is very, very difficult. And this is, you know, the, the calculations that you're talking about with inflation and with your return kind of show why it is so difficult. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, um, but it is, um, it's a very small number of people who are able to build up a fortune in that way. Yeah, I'm. I'm also not talking about uh, uh, building up a fortune. Eh? Uh, I, I no. I'm only talking about um, investing better than inflation. Eh? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. And 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 so, but of course, I fully agree. If you want to become rich, you know, if you want to uh, tenfold your capital or more, uh, the, uh, that's not possible to passive in, uh, investing uh, because. Um, uh, it is possible, uh, but you, yeah, it is possible, but you need to have uh, 20 years in a row, uh, around 15 to 20 percent a year, and then you are a top investor. Huh? Yeah, then you're uh, uh, you're one in a million, basically. Yeah, indeed. So, so that's very hard. Uh, but I do think that um, um, keeping up with inflation is the minimum. You really should ha have that with your investments and the permanent portfolio uh, allows you to do that in a very like uh, safe way. Mm -hmm. huh? um, um, but but um, if you, you know, I I'm still, I'm betting the other half, uh, uh, not on the PP, but on a concentrated investment in gold. And yeah, I'm still supporting that, uh, but indeed like, I don't have the expectation to become rich of this. Um, no, you know, I still have a, like I have a, a dream to become considerably richer and tenfold or hopefully hundredfold my capital. But I, I, I put my bets there on building a company, you know, yeah. uh, that's the only way you can do that. Yeah. Now let's just um, sort of finish by talking about your, your thoughts on protecting yourself against inflation, because you mentioned that you are, you know, you do um, put a lot of your investments into precious metals, in particular gold and silver. And so, you know, is, is this, you know, if people are thinking like, well, what the hell am I supposed to do um, about inflation? I can't control it. There's nothing I can do. It's in, entirely, you know, it's, these are, these are massive forces way out of my control. What do you do as an individual to, to try to protect yourself from this um, hidden tax? Well, the hidden tax eh, is the 5% they steal every year, um, or the seven, like this, um, like if you wanna protect yourself, uh, the permanent portfolio is excellent. Uh, I don't agree with the reasoning to buy gold uh, to protect yourself against inflation. That's just wrong thinking. Um, like gold has been a total disaster in the 80s and 90s to protect yourself against inflation. It didn't work at all. Instead of going up with five, six, seven percent, which it also had to do that in that period, it went down with five percent a year. So you lost like 10 percent per year with gold 20 years in a row. So you mm. totally destroyed your capital uh, with gold. So gold is not a protector against inflation. Um, or at least it's not in all circumstances, I think is, is, is probably the way I would put it. Because in, in terms of hyperinflation, then gold seems to have performed in those types of circumstances very well. But I understand what you're saying that, you know, if you just think, oh, I put all my money in gold and I'll be fine then you have, to, you have to remember that there's been 20 years when gold is not protected even against inflation. It's lost real value. Uh, yes, indeed. So it's, but it's just that today, and actually in the golden standard also, um, uh, gold sometimes go up in purchasing power and sometimes go down, you yeah. know? Yeah. Even when gold was money, that yeah. was the case. You know, and so, um, uh, so, so just to recap on what you just said, because you said it quite quickly, but just so that people get that. So your, your view is if you want to protect against inflation, don't depend on like a, just a single strategy of putting your money in gold. Your, your approach is if you have a diversified balanced portfolio, like for example, the permanent portfolio approach, 
then whatever happens, you're going to be okay because you you know, whichever asset class is doing well within a permanent portfolio is going to kind of keep keep your value. Is that is that what you're saying? Yes, indeed. And I want to add to that. That was even true eh, when we had the golden standard. How could you protect yourself in 1600 in the Netherlands against rising real estate prices, which actually caused your gold to go down by 50% in purchasing power in that period uh, versus real estate? How could you have protected yourself while well, by having a permanent portfolio at the time, you know? Right. Like even in 1600, a permanent portfolio was better to protect your purchasing power than, 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 than gold. Oh. Right, right. So I think that's really interesting because a lot of people talk about inflation and they talk about just using um, uh, hard assets like gold and silver as a protection against that. But what you're saying is actually that the protection that you need is to be ready for whatever economic circumstances come by having a diversified portfolio like the permanent portfolio approach. Is that right? Indeed. If your goal is just, you know, fuck, I don't want to take, invest. I don't want to spend money, uh, money, time, energy on investing wise, uh, well. Uh, I don't want to speculate. I don't want to risk. I just want to keep my capital and it needs to preserve its purchasing power. I want yeah. to have that inflation. Well, then it's a permanent portfolio you need and not gold, you know. Right. Go gold is a, a is a speculative position, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is coming from someone who actually does speculate heavily in gold, but you're still saying that, uh, you know, in terms of pure protection, it's the diversification that counts. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because it is, it is possible that this whole crisis atmosphere goes down the coming one, two, three years, and you get prosperity, and stocks go up, and gold falls 50%. It's possible. Yeah. And... Uh, I don't estimate chances high, but it is possible. And if yeah. you then fooled yourself today by saying, oh, I just put it all in gold and then my inflation problem is solved. Well, you could be really wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and you could really like destroy your capital in just four or five years mm. uh, with that strategy, you know? Um, yeah, so I think like gold is an excellent investment, but you need to buy it for the right reasons. And this being very aware that you, it's a speculative position. You're going to bet on something. Eh? Yeah. And, and you can really make a lot of money with it, but also you can lose a lot of money with it. Hmm? Fantastic. I think that's really helpful, Mark. Thank you so much. I pre really appreciate your thoughts on, on uh, inflation and investing. I think that's really helpful. And uh, thanks so much for, for doing the podcast. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for uh, having me. I really enjoyed uh, talking about this. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for the questions. I really... Uh, I liked uh, what we talked about. So, yeah, I hope to talk to you soon. Me too. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.